thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Patrick. I really appreciate it. Um, all right, so before I get going, I think there are just some disclosure statements here that have to be uh, shared. Um, so this is the disclosures from the planning committee, um, and I'll share my own uh, financial disclosures in just a moment. Uh, but today I will be, uh, I titled my presentation as Making Clinical Lab Careers Not the Road Less Traveled. Um, now many of you found your way into this field, but there are many other people who might want to be in this field and just don't know how to get there. Um, so I will be talking a little bit about some of the work that we have been doing in our center, uh, as uh, Patrick said, in partnership with ASCP and others to better understand how to improve career pathways into clinical lab jobs. But I'll say up front that there are many parallels to those career pathways as what we struggle with across many different healthcare occupations. So just briefly, uh, I have no particular financial relationships to disclose, but I will say that the studies that I'm sharing today have been funded by the uh, Siemens Health and Ears Fund of the Siemens Foundation, as well as the Health Resources and Services Administration of the uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services as part of a, a center grant that we have with them. So none of my uh, views are representing e any of those uh, entities. And br briefly, before I go into uh, the uh, studies that I want to share with you today, uh, I do, I do want to invite you to get to know the Center for Health Workforce Studies, or CHOOSE is what we call it for short. CHOOSE has had a history of 25 years of being housed in the Department of Family Medicine in our research section. Uh, some of that work really kind of grew out of the fact that there's a whammy rural health research center that also has been sitting there for 35 years. And the origins of some of those roots there is that there's been there was a real interest uh, many decades ago and continues today to understand the geographic distribution of primary care providers. So they invited a geographer to join the research section of the Department of Family Medicine who helped to build out a program of research around rural health and then followed by health workforce. So I'm fortunate to step into a center or director role that has really been built by a number of folks before me. Um, and our center, uh, I certainly don't do the work by myself. I'm very fortunate to work with a wonderful team of people, both research scientists who are full-time with us of a variety of backgrounds, and faculty members from across the university, including within the School of Medicine, but also schools of pharmacy, school of nursing, school of public health, et cetera. So what we do is not only focus on primary care, we really do focus on trying to elevate research across all healthcare workers as a way to try to understand some shared common challenges challenges that healthcare workers struggle with. And our aim is to try to inform health policy planners and health uh, uh, policy makers um, who are trying to figure out the best way to distribute our healthcare workers across the country. Now I'll say that we don't have one single entity in this country that sits there and does the workforce planning in this country. The, Depart uh, the Health Resources and Services Administration plays a very important role in terms of funding different programs to help train and educate healthcare workers. They do fund a lot of work to do uh, projections of the future supply of healthcare workers and they, they identify things like sh where there might be shortage areas but they really are uh, more of a supportive agency in the same way as NIH is where they don't sit there and necessarily direct states to say, uh, figure out what is the right number of people to be having in different uh, arenas. Um, in our work, then, we support and use uh, state, uh, federal grants and state contracts and other funders to help us understand things like what are the career pathways for people into healthcare jobs? What are those policies and programs that we should be investing in to support a more diverse workforce into the future? And what are some recruitment and retention efforts that employers should be considering? So this is kind of a theme that you'll see throughout today as I talk about uh, my, my lecture. And we have colleagues all across the country, and I uh, also invite you to check them out. Um, our, we have in our center two federally funded Health Workforce Research Center grants, but there, we are two of about nine different grants uh, that now exist across the country um, at different uh, universities where each of us have slightly different theme areas. Uh, so at UCSF, they have a theme area along, long, around long-term care. University of North Carolina is a behavioral health workforce research center. Uh, there's a new public health workforce Workforce Research Center at University of Minnesota. And in our center, we actually focus on uh, issues of health equity and thinking about the role of healthcare workers in addressing health equity and thinking about the diversity of healthcare workers. But we also have this portfolio of work around allied health. 
Allied health is not the most popular term. Uh, we have yet to come up with a really good term. Um, it basically lumps everybody who's not a doctor, nurse, or dentist, uh, and we are allowed to study that group. And that is where the clinical lab workforce has fallen into our portfolio, portfolio of work. Um, so I do want to uh, give that context there. And if you want to learn more about what all these centers are doing, the last link there, the Health Workforce Technical Assistance Center, is a great place where they have pulled together a lot of the resources across the different centers. Uh, so you can do a one-stop shop to uh, see the different reports and publications that have come out of these centers, as well as some webinars, which are very useful to better understand if you want to dig more into health workforce research. So today, uh, I have a few objectives. Um, I'm going to do my best to talk about common pathways into clinical lab careers. And I will say up front that there are not common pathways, really, to this field. Uh, there are many pathways to this field as, as we're trying to um, figure out and how to articulate. And there's many different people who enter this field. And it's clearly a, a, cr a field with many different kinds of jobs. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the barriers and facilitators that we are aware of uh, that helps to develop a more sustain sustainable clinical lab workforce. And I'm going to talk about some policy approaches to strengthening the clinical lab workforce that are not specific necessarily to the clinical lab workforce, but are things that we're learning from across different healthcare uh, fields. And I do recognize that many of you in this audience are in this field and probably are living this every day. So this is probably information that I'm preaching to the choir. You already know some of this, but I hope that by the end you do take away some new points and at least recognize you're not alone in some of these challenges and that we can try to learn from other fields and that we don't have to always reinvent the wheel. So why clinical lab professions? You're probably thinking, of course, why not? Why not the clinical lab profession? Um, the pandemic certainly brought to light the importance of, of this field and the important role that you all played uh, and have been playing in many different ways, but particularly in helping us diagnose and um, figure out how to manage uh, COVID. Um, and, uh, and it's not a small field. I mean, if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics and how they count up people in this field, which has, have its own problems, we have about half a million people who work in this field. So that's a fairly large uh, occupational category. Just to give you a sense, uh, there are about 15 million people who work in the healthcare industry. And out of that 15 million people, one of the biggest occupational groups are registered nurses. And that's probably along the lines of about 1.5 million or so people who work in that occupation by itself. So clinical lab, when you put them together, is fairly large. Now, this includes folks who fall into categories like clinical lab technologists and technicians, as well as phlebotomists. And within that uh, uh, occupational title of clinical lab te technologists and technicians, I certainly have learned that there are many occupations under that category and that there needs to be some work to make sure that these titles are up to date. And so that's something that's revised every some 10 years. So that takes some work to improve. But if I just focus on the clinical lab technologists and technicians as collected by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there are about 340,000 folks who fall in that category of workers. The other remaining um, that make up the rest is about, uh, is, are phlebotomists. That's uh, what makes up that other uh, remaining amount. And about half of the folks who work in this field um, are working in hospitals as a major place of employment, followed by medical and lab diagnostic labs. So just a little bit more about the COVID pandemic. Uh, the, uh, HRSA had us write a brief uh, about the role of different kinds of healthcare workers during the pandemic and what were different uh, states doing to try to increase the capacity of workers because we certainly encountered challenges uh, as the pandemic came about of just a high volume of tests that needed to be done. Um, we need to make sure that we uh, were able to meet, meet patient needs. And the clinical lab workforce was certainly uh, brought into the forefront as a critical group that we needed to figure out how to surge and get people out there into the field. And so these are just some example things that we learned that states were doing to try to expand the capacity of the clinical lab workforce Course, such as uh, allowing for non-laboratory spaces for testing to occur. So that could be just things like a parking lot was now considered a testing site that was allowable. Uh, there were uh, opportunities to um, allow people who might have had license that expired recently for states that do license uh, medical lab scientists to come back into the field without necessarily extra paperwork. So that was a common activity. Uh, there was also um, out-of-state license that were accepted across state borders because many health professions, not just in the clinical lab, people are licensed in the state to practice in a state. 
And so being able to move across states usually takes extra paperwork. And so some of that burden was lifted or at least attempted to be lifted during this period of time. Um, and that what was interesting too, um, and maybe there's some thoughts about this, is that other kinds of non-laboratory personnel were per permitted to help administer COVID-19 tests like pharmacists. And so we did see some um, elevation of different other kinds of workers to say, what kind of skill sets do they have that can help uh, with the expanded uh, needs that came about with due to COVID? Now, before COVID, uh, but certainly became much more uh, of a challenge during the pandemic, is that there were there have been a number of challenges uh, facing the field aside from just getting pure numbers uh, into place. One is that we need more training programs in order to get more people to uh, get, have the qualifications that we need to get them out there. But then once they're out there in the field, we need to make sure that people are qualified. And then in general, the volume of work has been increasing over time, especially with increasing um, new tests that are coming on board. And so we need to make sure that that volume of work can be met. And then ultimately just employers are demanding for more workers and they are feeling that their needs are unmet. And it is from these um, challenges that led to a partnership uh, between our center and the American Society for Clinical Pathology. Uh, one of our advisory members put us in touch with ASCP uh, to better understand and dig into some of these challenges because these challenges are fairly high level concerns. And so we want to unpack a little bit more what those issues might be and to better understand, well, what are people doing now to address those challenges and what are some of those barriers to doing that? And this is the report that Patrick mentioned and there's a, a bit.ly um, link here. And I certainly recommend uh, checking this out for more details, but I'll just go through them somewhat briefly um, about what we did and some of those findings from this study. So in partnering with ASCP, we worked, uh, we focused on six occupations. As I, as you all are very aware, there are many occupations in this field, so it's hard to kind of pick and choose which occupations to focus on. But we tried to pick occupations that had some combination of uh, a fairly large size. Uh, they were representative of different levels of careers in the field um, and uh, had different kinds of roles. So these were six occupations that we picked. Uh, and then we did a literature review combined with key informant interviews. We did some semi-structured uh, interviews with 16 uh, key informants. And uh, we also conducted a number of focus groups. And we did this actually in 2020, July through October, because the study actually started, or the conceptualization started before the pandemic. So we found ourselves very well primed to talk to people right as the pandemic was really going on. That also meant it was quite of a burden on the people who, were, who we were interviewing and doing focus groups with because they had a lot of other things to worry about at this time. So I do want to recognize that we were very grateful for people's time and energy that they spent with us to share their thoughts. But we probably also missed some people who were probably really in the thick of things at this time. Uh, so we talked to a variety of people, including academic program directors. I think UW may have been a member in there. Uh, at, least, at least certainly we had talked to folks here at UW. We know that you are all recognized very much as leaders in this field. That certainly comes across uh, as we talk to people around the country. Um, we talked to people in the employment sector, and we talked to different professional organizations and, and associations. So before I get into some of those findings, and I know there's a lot of small detail in here, and that's not as critical here, but one of the things when we did our lit review and tried to bring together and tell the story about the clinical lab workforce was this recognition that there are many different pathways to get into clinical lab jobs. Uh, it can range from having phlebotomists or clinical lab assistants having less than a year's amount of post-secondary education to as, as long as a, a doctorate for those who might have a doctorate in clinical lab sciences. So the educational span is large and it's not always one way by which one gets into these pathways. Now I understand there might be a number of people who have a medical lab science background, the MLS background, and you can come into the field with a variety of um, backgrounds, whether it be directly into an MLS program, or maybe you had a bachelor's degree and then you did a certificate, um, or maybe you're even at the master's level and do additional certificates. What's appealing about that from a health workforce planner perspective is that that means there's many opportunities for people to jump on into the career. That's a really appealing uh, prospect, as well as the fact that it doesn't necessarily take 
a doctorate in order to have a career in the field. That also is very appealing. Uh, but that also creates challenges around visibility and creating clear career pathways and making sure that people can move from one career to another. And this will come across uh, in, as I talk and continue on. So some of the challenges that we were hearing from our interviews and from our focus groups, uh, I'm going to organize in a few different ways. I'm going to talk about challenges in the education and training, challenges in recruit, uh, employment, and, and some other kinds of challenges in recruitment and retention. But from the education and training standpoint, and many of you in the room and online may be educators yourself, these are probably things that you're already very aware of and feeling, is that what we were hearing is that recruitment could have been improved with greater visibility and awareness. That theme came up over and over again, is this feeling that people were not aware, young people were not aware that these were career options for them. Uh, there was a need for uh, enhanced student support, recognizing that it wasn't just about the cost of education that was a challenge for making sure people could get into uh, these clinical lab careers, but it was also about making sure that people had other services like childcare support if they wanted to pursue a career here. There was things like covering tutoring, finding ways to uh, get tutoring support that was necessary, as well as the fact that even once you get your education, there are a number of exams that have to be done, and those cost money. And these little, they might seem like little things here and there, but you start adding it up, it is a significant cost. And may maybe many of you have experienced that personally. There's a need to make sure that curriculum is regularly updated and kept up to speed with what employers wanted um, or want, and, uh, and that there is, uh, that even though graduation and program uh, completion rates were high across uh, all occupations from what we heard, which is a very positive thing. So that means once people came into, the, uh, into these programs, they actually managed to complete it and, and um, with high rates of success, and that's exciting. Um, but that also, uh, but what came out of that is the fact that there needed to be more programs to allow more people to be also be, be able to come through these programs. From an employment perspective, other challenges that came up were that um, from a recruitment standpoint, that there were challenges with regards to the wages that they were able to offer um, workers, workload and burnout have been concerns, and again, visibility and awareness of the occupations was a concern. Retention, and retention is particularly important uh, from our perspective because you can try to recruit your way out of a problem, but you probably can't ever fill the gaps fast enough. You're better off trying to focus on the current workforce that's in place and try to figure out how to make sure that, they, that you keep them because there are many more people currently working than there are ever coming out of a, of a program. So we were uh, uh, interested very much in what some of the retention uh, approaches and challenges that employers were facing and what they, what they did recognize is that there were variable kinds of professional development and continuing education options across employers. It was not consistent and they were not always like tied back to a degree. So that certainly is a problem. Uh, and that there were limited opportunities for career advancement. Employers did recognize that there, the opportunities for people once they came into their settings, that people wanted the opportunity to move into more advanced roles. But creating those roles was not always so easy. There were people who were sitting in positions for many, many years, and sometimes you can't move anyone into a higher level until that person retires. So that certainly came across as a challenge. From a policy and practice standpoint, some challenges that came across were, and, and I would say challenges are also opportunities, right? So they certainly recognize that techn technological advancements were coming, uh, and I think now, I mean, AI certainly is a hot topic now, and we're trying to figure out how to harness the value of these, but also new hardware is coming on board, and that might help to improve the efficiency of a worker, but it also creates a lot of strain on the workers as they try to figure out how to get the training that they need to stay abreast of the new technolo technological advancements that were coming. And then uh, in the health system broadly, there has been a lot of consolidation in businesses. And that activity creates a lot of pressure uh, in, on the workforce as usually the story that's done is that, well, we're going to consolidate to create efficiencies and therefore our product lines will be able to make more money. But somewhere along the line, down the line, people usually get cut and they lose their jobs. Um, and that creates a, a really stressful environment for workers. And a lot of times, too, the business consolidation can happen among for-profit entities. And then the motivations might also change for an organization where they're finding themselves pushing for the bottom line rather than feeling like they're doing something for the greater good. 
Policy uh, issues around reimbursement are a challenge, making sure uh, that Medicare is actually reimbursing uh, labs for the services that they're providing in a way that um, is uh, able to actually keep up with payment of the workers themselves who are doing the work is also important. And some of this has to do with also a lack of visibility from Medicare's point of view about the importance of clinical lab workers and the role that they're playing. From our focus groups, we heard a number of uh, key themes, uh, and, and really I'm going to summarize some of the um, strategies that people were using to try to improve the clinical lab workforce. And these are just some of the few themes, and they're very similar to some of the challenges. So. Um, in addressing some of these challenges, again, people were trying to figure out how to improve the visibility of the clinical lab workforce, how to improve workforce retention and recruitment, and, and as well as the topic of diversity and inclusion certainly came up as part of these conversations. So in the recruitment and retention strategies, um, there, there were many, including uh, a lot of uh, employers uh, as well as academic programs, but these are strategies done by employers. They did things like trying to do outreach, trying to find ways to partner with different agencies, they saw the need to provide sign-on bonuses. They were doing what they could to raise awareness of the profession, and they're trying to offer competitive benefits. Uh, from a retention standpoint, they were trying to, again, provide some financial incentives, provide a supportive environment, provide a flexible workforce and career pathways. Uh, so among uh, the training programs, some uh, strategies that were done is that they, they have been trying to outreach, especially to underrepresented communities. Uh, they were partnering with STEM programs. And I would say one of the things is that there was a sense that the field is fairly diverse already. Uh, and I think what we recognize is that that needs to not be taken for granted. Uh, I think the feeling is that since community college is a common source of um, education for folks who might enter the field, and community colleges tend to be a fairly diverse uh, community, that therefore this then led to a more diverse workforce. I feel like that thinking was a little bit um, of a stretch in terms of saying that that seems to be the way by which we want to diversify the field. So uh, we were pushing them to better understand what did they try to do to do more to improve diversity and inclusion in the field. And these were some of the things that we heard, but I think there were certainly, uh, we were left with the feeling that a lot more could be done to make sure that it's more purposeful. So while these strategies are done by some, it's not done by all. But all of these uh, report findings, uh, through it all, we certainly learned that the COVID pandemic created an urgency to make sure that the clinical lab workforce was really a strong and sustainable one, but that there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach for all programs, for all uh, employment situations. And so as a result, ASCP actually took a lot of the recommendations or a lot of the thoughts that came out of this report and created a blueprint for action. And I strongly recommend, I think, for those who are in a leadership position to particularly focus on this document. This blueprint for action at this point in time is taking real life uh, in ASCP. I can see ASCP is bringing together a number of organizations in the clinical lab field to try to help uh, move people forward as a collective in this field to really put into action some of the some of the strategies that other people were identifying as what was working. At a very basic level, I know there have been a number of activities to just try to streamline the titles of occupations and training programs. And I understand that it has not been an easy path, but it is one that the field probably has made some significant movement to try to move forward. This seems like a very pedantic activity, but a very important one, because when I say registered nurse, most of you can probably quickly understand what that role is. If you talk to a lay person about a clinical lab job, if it's not your friend or family member, it doesn't convey something as clearly. And I think the field recognizes that, that name matters. And so there's a lot of work that's starting there first. And it, it seems like a fairly simple first step, but a very important first step. So we are continuing to work with ASCP to try to better understand some of the career pathways into the clinical lab workforce. Because while we're talking about improving visibility and awareness of the field, one of the challenges is trying to figure out, well, as we raise awareness, we need to also tell people, how do you get into the field? What are those things that you do to take those steps forward to take, get a career in this field? So we have a HRSA-funded study um, that we put a, a fielded a survey, and uh, I'll give some more details on that. But these were some of the questions that we were trying to understand, which are, which are the cl career pathways of, of current clinical lab work for, uh, workers and what their career plans were into the future. So we developed a survey instrument with expert input from a number of people in the field, including uh, the ASCP's Workforce Committee. 
and we collected data between May and June of this year. And in total, we had about 1,500 responses. We collected and focused on workers, uh, the same, pretty much the same set of workers as what we had in the earlier report, with a slight change of uh, adding systologists. Uh, but in our initial analysis, we were really focusing on the MLS uh, careers. And uh, we will soon go on into some of the other occupations. And I just have this little uh, framework here on the side that just gives you a sense of the kind of domains that we were trying to cover in our survey. So these are preliminary findings, and we're still trying to figure out the best way to kind of bring them together. Um, but what, um, what we were finding, or what we were finding, is that uh, we asked people, what were their motivations for entering the profession? Like, how did they even decide that this was something that they wanted to do? And um, at the top of the list are that people were exposed to a family or a friend who was working in the field. And people could uh, check off multiple boxes. So we were finding about a third of the people in our sample were saying that that's really their main way of finding their way into the field. And that means that you all are ambassadors for the field. The stories that you tell your brothers, your sisters, your nieces, your nephews, your friends, the stories you tell about your life is making a difference. It really makes a difference. And it, it is by that 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 starts a conversation of, well, how do I get into your job? And that is an important thing to recognize is the value of your own storytelling um, in terms of getting people into this field. College counselors, advisors, career centers also play a very important role. It sounded like ASCP had in particular an assumption that maybe that that might be higher in, in the list here, um, but it, and it's no doubt a, an important role. One in five people did say that that was an important uh, source of information for people to come into the career. Followed by social media and other job boards and et cetera, but the top two, as you can see, is really requires a personal touch at this point in time for people to find their way into the career. Now, people certainly probably are aware of different TV shows that are out there uh, that probably highlight uh, the clinical lab opportunities. Uh, it, forensic science has certainly probably raised people's awareness. And it might be silly. You might feel like, oh, does that really represent me? But I would say, again, that is an opportunity for people to feel like they can connect to something. They have some visual of maybe what a career might look like. And again, you have the opportunity to figure out how to help translate. What does the real world really look like relative to this TV show that you might be watching? Um, but it is, I do find it encouraging when we do see more, um, more accessible sources um, provide these uh, visuals of what a career might look like here. Because you think about, I said there, there's about half a million people who work in the field, but we have about 35 million people in this country. Uh, and we have a lot of people who are not being exposed to people like you and have these conversations. Some people aren't going to colleges. They aren't in places that have career centers. So how do we make sure that they know that these are careers that they can have? When we talk to folks about their uh, job satisfaction and career outlook, we found that people were fairly happy with their jobs, which is really encouraging and not something we often hear, is that people are feeling fairly happy. That's not to say that it's completely um, without some challenges. So at the very top, uh, it, and uh, the way the slides kind of work here is that the darker color of blue is saying that they strongly agree with various statements, and the yellow and orange colors are saying that they strongly disagree um, or disagree with these statements. So at the very top there, there's a strong level of agreement in, um, uh, around the statement of that their job provides them the work schedule that they prefer. So that they're feeling like they are getting a flexible schedule that works well for them. Uh, that they, the, the next one is that they feel that they are able to work at the full extent of their education and training, um, as well as feeling like they more or less work in a safe work environment. However, at the bottom there, it's worth noting that some of the reasons why satisfaction was lower had to do with leadership. Uh, whether the statement of had, uh, has a strong management or leadership got uh, about, a 30, a third, uh, about a third of the respondents said that they did not agree with that statement, that they felt that they had strong management or leadership. Uh, over half of respondents said also that they did not feel like they worked in a place that was adequately staffed. So while personal satisfaction seems quite high, the environment really matters and can really drive happiness uh, in a job, but also this is what contributes to retention if we don't address the environmental factors. 
Again, we asked some additional questions about uh, people's feeling about their careers. And at the top, uh, we found that people felt very strong about the statement that they feel like they were accomplishing worthwhile things in their jobs and that they enjoy their work. So again, on a personal level, people felt like they were really um, enjoying their every day. However, near the bottom, again, the, the organizational parts are what kind of come into play and bring the satisfaction down. One of them is the statement of this feeling valued by professionals outside of the team. I wonder how many of you feel like you've had to explain what your role is to other people on the healthcare team. Uh, similarly, uh, this feeling of not feeling appreciated by the institution was also an area where there is a high level of dissatisfaction. So again, it feels maybe a little bit of a, um, a dichotomy that there are these two feelings of satisfaction and dissatisfaction, but it is something about the personal side that people are finding a lot of enjoyment. And it, it would be really a shame if we we're saying that the organization is squashing that level of satisfaction and happiness. So the organization does play a critical role in making sure that we retain our workers. And that's why in a lot of the work that we do, we are talking to employers to try to tell them, here are some things to consider uh, to move forward. And I'll come to some of those uh, solutions in just a moment. From a financing point of view, uh, we did see, we asked what were some methods of financing people were using to go uh, through their uh, MLS program. And we found that self-financing was at the top of that list. Uh, about three-fourths of people had at least some source of out-of-pocket in order to fund their uh, education, followed by federally assisted loans and employers, although that certainly is much lower on the list. And again, you can check off multiple things here. Um, now, what was interesting, and the way we categorize the uh, different groups of workers is something we're still working on a little bit, but the darker bar uh, really is trying to point to more recent MLSs, while the lighter bar is, is uh, suggesting that these are people who were MLSs sometime in the past. And I think what what's particularly worth noting is that the more recent MLSs are saying that they do have some kind of a student loan, while in the past, employers played a more significant role in providing some support to clinical lab workers um, to, for, to pursue their education. And the student loan, as someone who's still trying to figure out how to pay off my own student loans uh, and try and mess around with a public loan service loan forgiveness program, which I'm very grateful for, but certainly recognize the challenges in that, is that loans stay with you for years. I've been out of grad school for a number of years now. I'm still paying off mine. And so while federally assisted uh, student loans are important because oftentimes they can give you subsidies or low interest rates and whatnot, it is still a loan and a debt, and that can be a challenge. And it can be a challenge for anyone looking to pursue a further along career. Th imagine if you took on the debt at the undergraduate level. Thinking about graduate school and adding to that loan from that is a real bur uh, barrier for many folks. And I do want to say that, that you're not alone. In the field of nursing, uh, this is a study uh, that we published recently on the registered nurse uh, workforce, looking at both uh, those with a, an associate's degree as well as those with a bachelor's degree in nursing, because both of those are entryways into the nursing prof profession. And we did ask this question of how many of you all are finding yourself having to do any kind of self-financing. And we were finding that the associate degree nurses who are basically uh, two years of community college, uh, they about two-thirds of them were spending money out of pocket, while 70% of the bachelor's level nurses were spending money out of pocket. Uh, so just, just to, as a comparator there, um, and so j just to put some situa situation of the context here is that in the clinical lab field, it seems like more people are relying on, on self-financing, but it's not so far off from what bachelor's in nurse or nursing are experiencing. Now, I don't want to leave folks on a note of feeling like, well, I already knew all this. Um, so I want to give you some sense of some strategies or things to think about as we try to move forward. And I, I, look, I take this from a, mostly from a policy lover standpoint. Uh, and as an economist, of course, I can't get away from a talk without talking about supply and demand. And I don't have a supply and demand graph if you've ever taken an Econ 101 kind of course, but I am trying to provide this idea that it's a constant balance of supply versus demand. And when we're talking about supply, we're talking about the labor supply, the people, the workers, and, and, and what their people are working and they're providing a supply of their work, their human capital to a set of employees employers. And those employers are the ones who are um, seeking that supply, that human capital. And what they're doing is that they're trying to respond to patient needs. So that's kind of what's driving up employer demand is that supposedly there is a patient need behind it. 
Now, the labor supply is mostly um, driven by having a pool of qualified, willing, and able workers. Uh, and I'll come to what some of that, what that exactly means. Uh, but what tips the scale between the two are different policy levers around wages, uh, national policies uh, and programs, technology, thinking about the distribution of workers, and available substitutes. So here are just some more examples of supply barriers as I kind of group them into these three categories. Having a pool of workers is, is, is important. Uh, and it's uh, not as simple as just saying there are bodies that are just available that have some training in the field. People have to be able to uh, actual, actually be able to go to work. And COVID really put a fine point on that. People were not able to go to work because a lot of people were sick. <laughs> We had high rates of COVID among our healthcare workers. The prevalence rate from what I, at least the data that I could find, and it is certainly spotty and has some challenges, is that the prevalence of COVID it was certainly higher than the rest of the population. Now on a positive note, I will say the case fatality rate among the uh, folks with COVID among healthcare workers is much lower than the rest of the population. So that's a positive note. But nonetheless, when you are sick with COVID, you can't come to work. You're not available. That's a problem. And that was a significant problem for, for a very long time. Another way by which we are taking people out of the labor pool is by the fact that people have childcare and other caregiving responsibilities, whether it be for elderly parents or whatnot. As, a, as an only child of aging parents, I certainly recognize that at some point in time, I will be very responsible for my parents. Uh, the joke has been that they follow me around the country, and no, no kidding, they live in Polsbo now. Um, and so I love them. And I do recognize that uh, they, I'm very lucky that they're very healthy now, but at some point in time when they are not, as an only child, I, will, I might find myself having to reconsider some of my availability, my ability to work uh, and be available. And so these things are real problems uh, in terms of making sure that we have an available supply of workers. Uh, in terms of people not being willing to work, this is where burnout comes out. You know, people have been feeling very stressed. And while I said that the field is feeling fairly happy or satisfied with their jobs, we certainly hear there is burnout. We, people are feeling stressed. They're feeling morally distressed by the environment in which they're in. Um, and that by itself makes people reconsider whether or not this is the job that they want to do. And that is, uh, that is a threat to our available pool of workers, as well as safety concerns. Um, making sure that people had the right PPE uh, and had the right safety protocols, uh, cleaning protocols that were in place to make people feel like they could do their job is also a threat to making sure that we have people who are willing to work. And then there's a lack of qualified applicants. And so that means that, um, you know, we might want people who are doctorally trained in medical lab science. However, that pathway is not something you just turn on a spigot and people just show up overnight. That is years in the making. I say this even about medical, uh, uh, medical uh, degrees as well as nursing degrees. It takes years of thinking and preparation before people find themselves into these jobs. It means going back to K through 12 education and making sure that we have people with the right science skills in order to get into these jobs, let alone being aware of these jobs. Um, so even if we want to train people quickly, oftentimes it's not so easy. Um, and as I mentioned, finances, financing is an issue. This is an issue uh, that I mentioned briefly at the beginning about uh, some of um, uh, the, the idea that other kinds of providers can provide certain kinds of uh, tests. And I know that right now there is some kind of ongoing uh, discussion about the role of registered nurses and being able to do some complex diagnostic tests and, uh, and whether or not MLS and uh, whether RNs can take on these tasks that MLS can do. And so I understand that's a politically tough topic, but this is about uh, scope of practice. This is a discussion that takes place over and over again in the healthcare environment. The probably most notable area that we know a lot about this discussion is around nurse practitioners versus physicians and the role especially that they play in primary care. But this happens among the dental field, this happens in the pharmacy field, and this is happening in the medical lab science field. And I think a question that com it comes back to is, are we using people at the top of their license? Are we using them at the top of their training and education? Are we leveraging people to use the maximum, uh, maximum level of their skills? Because if we are not, then that means that it, that's an under-tapped uh, resource that we may not be um, leveraging. And that there may be tasks that you are currently doing that is probably not appropriate for the level of training that you should be doing. And that somebody else on the 
team should probably take over and can take over some of those tasks. And so all of these have solutions. Um, and I do want to say that while we are uh, hearing these things at a national level, we have this uh, program called the Sentinel Network in their Center for Health Workforce Studies, where we are asking employers in the state of Washington, like, what are you doing to solve some of these problems? And they are saying a lot of the same things that we are hearing or hearing at the national level. And this is something that we're doing twice a year at this point in time. And we're asking questions from Sentinels, who are basically employers who raise their hand and say, we are willing to answer questions about the workforce, about their workforce challenges. And I'll say that what was notable in some of the recent uh, Central Network findings is that clinical lab uh, technicians and technologists were near the top of the list of workers that they felt that they were struggling to recruit. And when we, when we asked them, well, what are you doing about that? Um, I mean, or, and why is this an issue? Um, these are some of the quotes that come out of it. This is not meant to be a representative sample. This is really meant to be a signaling system to help us understand kind of consistent trends over time in a more rapid fashion. And, and we certainly would encourage folks to, um, uh, we certainly encourage folks around the country to, uh, around the state to include their uh, responses here so that we can have a more rich data set. But um, we certainly are hearing that when it comes to retention and turnover being a problem, um, we asked uh, a little bit more about like, well, what did they try to, what were some of the challenges or things that they tried to do about it? Some of the things that we were hearing about is, is exactly the, these levers that I was saying uh, earlier is that they're finding that they're lacking experienced candidates. They're lacking uh, stability of the current uh, rural versus uh, local job, job market within the medical field. And this is something we were hearing before the pandemic. And as the pandemic has gone on or wherever, whatever state you want to say that we're in right now, we're hearing that people are saying that they have a shortage of applicants in their region. They're seeing housing costs as a problem. They're seeing that lack of childcare as a problem. So all these things I'm saying are levers uh, that kind of push the supply challenge. We are hearing directly from the actual employers themselves. So these aren't just made up reasons. These are actual things that people are f struggling with right now. Rural areas, there's a geographic challenge here. Uh, making sure that we have the right uh, applicants with the right qualifications is important. So each of these uh, challenges have solutions. Uh, among the things uh, that it takes to make these solutions come into play, though, are, is political will. We need political will to make these things happen. Because, and these are big issues that are bigger than healthcare. These are societal problems that we are struggling with. It's not just about um, healthcare. And I think this is where I end up finding myself being a social justice, social justice warrior out there, where I say, like, we have to fi figure out ways to have a more collective effort to bring people together to fight for these things. That can be just things like having healthcare employers work with their chamber of commerce to figure out how to go to the le state legislature to fight for some of these things. So one of the uh, examples for how we can support uh, people uh, who might have COVID il illness is to make sure that everyone actually has paid sick leave. The other thing is thinking about ways that we can provide child care and dependent supports. Some of those benefits were put into place during the COVID pandemic, and some of it is starting to rapidly disappear as some of these emergency orders have come to an end. For burnout, uh, moral distress, and moral injury, we need to address workplace culture. And I realize that's not as easy as just saying, like, yeah, just change the environment. But there are many folks out there who are thinking about this with a lot of depth. Um, Going to qualified applicants, I think we need to make sure that we're investing in education and training programs and make sure that people are not finding themselves uh, really stuck with a lot of debt. And when it comes to uh, restrictive practice policies, we do need to make sure that people are practicing at the top of their license while also providing quality care. I did want to give a little bit of context about the larger uh, healthcare industry in, in which you're operating in, and you're probably very aware of this already. But the healthcare industry has been struggling with employment challenges since the pandemic. I mean, many of these environments have been struggling with these issues since before the pandemic. This is a graph that I've been trying to update over time, where I'm showing the level of employment in healthcare, different healthcare sectors, at the, right before the pandemic in January 2020, and showing the level of relative employment to uh, to that level. So you can see in the first few. Uh, uh, right on the left hand side, there's a massive drop there. That's the start of the pandemic employment levels just dropped across the board. So whenever we talk about employment, we have to kind of really think carefully about how we talk about that first several months of the pandemic. It was a mess across the healthcare system, if I were to put it simply. Um, but, and most of the sectors have been on a path to recovery. 
Um, and I'll note a couple key trends. Uh, one is the light blue line that are hospitals. It took about 30 months before hospitals felt that they uh, actually were reporting employment levels that were at the same level of their pre-pandemic levels. So hospitals have been talking for a long time about the shortages that they have been experiencing. And some of it is the fact that it has taken them 30 months, almost three years, two and a half years, to get back to the level of employment that they had before the pandemic. But yet the patient demand has really been pent up during the pandemic. So that's made it difficult as people are showing up with more serious illnesses that they just didn't take care of during the pandemic because they couldn't get to get to their uh, primary care doctors, um, as well as the fact that uh, nursing homes were really uh, and still currently are struggling right now with their staffing. And that's the yellow line there that's preventing discharges from hospitals. So hospitals are holding on to their patients a lot longer than they expected. Um, and so the yellow line there are the nursing and residential care facilities where they are now currently operating at about 5% below the pre-pandemic levels. They have been struggling with employment since before the pandemic. And, um, and I'll say that what's driving up those numbers right now are assisted living facilities. And actually, if you look at skilled nursing facilities, they are still operating at about 10% below the pre-pandemic levels. And some of that is related to the fact that nursing homes closed. Some of it is related to the fact that we have been moving at, uh, with, with some speed, and especially now with the pandemic, to move people out of institutions and into the home. We want more and more people to be able to age at home. There's a feeling that people want to be at home. And so there is a movement of that happening there. But nonetheless, skilled nursing facilities are feeling a lot of strain right now. And these things come back to the clinical lab field as you think about the challenges that you're feeling is that some of it is also a product of working with a lot of very stressed people who are struggling with workers, finding the right workers around them and, and finding people for their own team. And to some degree, there's competition that's happening between these different fields. Hospitals oftentimes are drawing workers from the nursing, uh, uh, the skilled nursing facilities. People are moving themselves out of skilled nursing facilities and taking jobs in hospitals because oftentimes they're better paid jobs. And so this internal competition is also affecting uh, the, the healthcare industry. And that gets me to uh, my next slide about the macroeconomic effects. Healthcare is an interesting field. It is one of the only fields that is what's called countercyclical to cycles of the economy. When the economy doesn't do well, healthcare does pretty well. Healthcare employment actually is better during times of recessions than, uh, uh, than other times. And some of that, there's a number of theories as to why that's the case. Um, some of it is this feeling that, well, healthcare doesn't care about the economy. If you have a healthcare problem, your health, your poor health, is not necessarily driven by whether or not the economy is doing well or not. And actually, maybe it even gets worse during bad times of the economy, right? There's a lot more depression, suicides, people's health problems start exacerbating, people don't have insurance, they're finding themselves with more severe illnesses, and so therefore they need more health care. And so that might be one of the reasons why it's acyclical. Now, the silver lining of that is that as we struggle and watch the feds try to in, uh, increase inflation rates and they're trying to ward off a recession, is that a recession may not actually be that bad of a thing for healthcare. Now, I don't wish for a recession. I want to be very clear. That's not something I'm asking for. But what happens in part also is that in a recession, jobs in the retail sector and the food service sector are lost. And those are very common sources of entry for many of our healthcare workers, especially in the nursing, uh, skilled nursing facilities. People are coming in from food service jobs, you know, Burger King, Amazon, you name it, they're coming from there. And part of it is that there are very low barriers to entry to these jobs. Uh, they don't require much more than a high school degree in some of these jobs. Phlebotomists fall in this category. And phlebotomists can pop in and out of these jobs all the time. And what they're looking for, what these workers are looking for, are all the benefits that I've been talking about. Think about how many commercials you have seen for Amazon or others, whether or not they're true or not in terms of following, following through with these things. But they talk about the tuition support that they provide their employees. They talk about the job career opportunities that they have. How many hospitals have you seen out there advertise those same benefits? I haven't necessarily seen too many of those kind of commercials. They really stick with me when I see the McDonald's folks who open up their college applications and they see that they got, to, got into their programs. Not to say that this doesn't happen in healthcare, but we could do better to advertise those opportunities. 
And these challenges and solutions are not unique to healthcare. And I did just want to put a nod out there for Claudia Golden, one of the three women uh, economists uh, who won a Nobel Prize recently. She has done a lot of work on wage gaps uh, for women versus men uh, in, the, in the broader economy. And it is worth noting that healthcare is one of of one of the few very dominantly female uh, fields. Uh, if you look at healthcare as a whole, 75% of people who work in healthcare are women. Um, and that oftentimes is at the lower skilled, lower levels of education kinds of jobs. And that we need to pay attention to some of the disparities that we have been seeing. And this is just by uh, you know sex, but really there are uh, racial and ethnic pay gaps that certainly exist as well. And that we need to be attentive to these issues. But this is a broader societal problem that we have to be attentive to. And that we're, we have to make sure that we situate our challenges within understanding these larger contexts. So that we know also that we're not alone. And that really brings me to my final thoughts. Um, when individuals find their ways to these careers, they are, these can be very good jobs. They are well-paid jobs, and they seem like people are very happy. Um, so we need to make sure that we keep it that way. We need to make sure people know that there are opportunities this way, and we can't take it for granted that it is this way. And I know many of you are working very hard to make sure make sure that, uh, that clinical lab opportunities are um, available to our undergraduates here. Patrick was just mentioning that to me, and so that's fantastic. Uh, and that employers need to focus on retention. Recruit, we can't recruit our way out of these problems. We need to figure out how to keep people and, uh, and make sure that they're feeling that they have a home in these jobs and that they, and employers recognize this, but I think it's important for everyone to recognize that we have competition from other sectors and that the strategies, there are many out there. We just need the political will to try to move them forward. So with that, I do want to acknowledge my co colleagues and co-authors on some of this, this work. And I thank you very much for your time and attention. And uh, with that, I'll stop there. Thank you. So I guess I'll take any questions either in the room or online. Um, maybe I'll look to uh, folks in the room first. We do have some online questions already. Um, and usually they, they start to come in too. So, um, and, and just to know, there's, there's over 50 participants online. So there's a big audience out there listening. Um, so one of our questions is, are there any surveys on facilities that were actually successful on recruitment and retention? Um, the, ask, the, the participant says that um, their experience in doing lab inspections across the U.S., that some were uh, institutions were actually doing quite well in retaining staff compared to others. That's a great question and something I think we struggle with uh, actually across the healthcare industry is trying to figure out how to identify what's working. We don't actually oftentimes target uh, and create repositories of solutions. And that's something some of us in the field have talked about is how do we identify what different employers are doing and what's working. And then you realize what ends up happening is that there's competition between these employers and that in some ways these are secrets that they want to hold close because it's working for them. So uh, unless we do have some more federal investments in, to, in terms of doing more regular facility level uh, questions that can get to the clinical lab piece, that's important. And there are facility level uh, um, uh, surveys that do exist out there, but I have not seen very many that provide questions or answers around the clinical lab workforce. I see one hand over here. Yeah. So the clinical laboratory technologist and phlebotomy program at Shoreline Community College closed during the pandemic. Um, and the reason why that they, they, they closed is because they didn't have the staff and the faculty to train people and couldn't find partners for, to, to you know, laboratory partners to that. Is, is there any, um, you know, are, are the dynamics kind of pushing away from that in terms of you know, reducing costs and everything, which means reducing you know, partnerships and shares? And, and what are the solutions, what are the potential solutions to, to um, uh, encourage training programs? Yeah, so that's a great question. And something that's at least finally gaining some uh, national recognition for nurses in particular. One of the biggest uh, problems that we've heard in the nursing field, there's constant this constant sense of that there's a shortage and that we just need to create more training programs. But the real chokehold there is the fa faculty. We don't have enough faculty. And then add to that, uh, there, and part of it is because uh, hospitals just pay much better than universities do or colleges do. And so the, the attractiveness of work 
working in, a, in an academic setting doesn't become as appealing. And I'm guessing that happens here too in this field. And the other piece of it is that clinical placements or having uh, opportunities to have on uh, while you're in school having that training, many places found themselves without preceptors. And uh, figuring out how to pay those preceptors is certainly one avenue to go, except for finding the money to actually pay those preceptors appropriately is a challenge. Now, what I am seeing from the nursing field is the fact that there is this collective effort among the nursing field is to raise that that is a problem. And, and that seems like it's a fairly simple one, but getting outside to other people outside of the uh, healthcare field is important to, under, to help pitch the story, like why it is so important to have the right clinical lab workers and that these are the specific areas you want to see investments. Because otherwise, I think there's a lot of feeling, uh, or what I've seen a lot, I think policymakers do, is that they come up with some solution that they think works best, but it's not really necessarily a well-informed solution. And so at the very first level is just making sure that the stories are very clearly articulated, that these are the areas you want investment. But I think there does require Require some federal investments at this point in time to help pay for, say, making it more appealing to take a faculty position over taking a private sector job. So not a perfect solution, but hopefully it gives some ideas that there's some parallels there. And then we have another online question. Um, for those of us who want to enter the field but are struggling with financial barriers, how would you suggest that we can get training? Yeah, yeah, financing, uh, the, the issue of how we pay for schooling is a large topic. And the Biden administration certainly put into effect some various public loan uh, forgiveness programs. And loan forgiveness programs are uh, one pathway to helping make um, uh, education may be affordable. This usually means that you commit to some number of years of service, whether it be in public service or uh, a rural uh, health care center, uh, something, some, some criteria is pegged to why you get um, your loans eventually paid back. And there are a number of these programs that exist out there. And I can see that what sometimes happens is that the list of occupations is based on like in terms of who is eligible for this is based a little bit on who lobbies for that occupation to be listed there. So one is I would say, well, this is not an immediate solution for somebody who's actively trying to find their way forward, is that um, is to make sure that, again, legislators are aware that this is a field that should, should fall into that pool of being a group that should get loan forgiveness. Now, I think the other side of it is that, as I mentioned, employers used to spend more money to help with training and education. So one is seeing if they're current, if they can get paired up with an employer who might be willing to invest in someone's education. And there are things called apprenticeship programs. They're regi federally registered apprenticeship programs that have good, solid uh, frameworks around what that means. Uh, I think we could do more in the clinical lab workforce to help uh, employers take on apprenticeship programs. That means that people are getting paid while they get their education. So they're working, they're getting their training, and they're getting paid. And then the next question actually builds from that to ask if there's examples that you're aware of of successful employee retention through opportunities for career advancement um, while, while in the profession. Yeah, well, I, if I understand that right, I think to some degree, uh, one of the retention tools that people use, or especially around apprenticeship, is saying that, well, once you go through this apprenticeship program, you owe us some number of years of service. And we have seen that for loan repayments, too, is that you have to owe some certain number of years of service. Um, and that can be helpful. Now we have seen, especially in among physicians and trying to recruit them to rural areas, that the years of investment uh, that they have to stay in a certain place doesn't necessarily lead to long-term staying power. And that, that means that there are, it's more than about the cost of education that really might matter there. That it's about feeling that they are invested in as a person, that they're seen as a person, that that seems to matter more. And that people also have the community supports that they need to be able to have a life in the community, meaning that they have the housing that they, that they can afford. That means having the child care supports that they can afford. So, so I see that we're probably at time. So thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you.